Hello, you're listening to On the Payroll, my podcast about consulting, project management, Salesforce, delivery, quality, testing, leadership. Uh, there's so many topics I'm really, really interested about. And what's really fun about the podcast is I get to talk about it with people that I like who are fascinated by the same topics. So today I'm talking to Jonathan Blair. He is a solutions architect at Maverick in Down Under um, in Australia. And we talk about his journey from um, South Africa to England and then moving on um, to um, Australia and the lessons he learned along the way. We talk about culture, we talk about how our experiences shape the people that we are and how we bring that to the projects that we do and interact with people and how best to approach it when we're aware that things like that are happening. So I really hope that you'll enjoy this episode as much as we did making it. Good evening, Jonathan. How are you today? I'm very good, thanks, Pei. Uh, and a very good morning to you. Thank you. Welcome and um, thank you for taking the time to come on my podcast on the payroll, where I talk about all things leadership, CRM and Salesforce, all the things that I think you and I would really enjoy to get stuck into. But actually, what I'd like to start is ask you about your journey if you can tell us a story about where you started you can start from any point and how you got to where you are I know you've moved continents a few times I'm so interested to hear how you've moved and how you found um found all of that so okay cool thanks Pei. um yeah I, I think my journey has been a varied one uh if if you if you see my um, my sort of CV on LinkedIn, it, it kind of goes down to to sort of 2007, 2008, I think. Um, but there's a whole stack of time before that 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 uh, I, I can I can lightly touch on in terms of uh, in terms of how I got to where I am now. Um, but maybe we'll start at the at the start of my Salesforce journey as a consultant. Um, I had spent sort of, I think it was around eight months um, in a bit of a funk, uh, not working, stuck in the UK and really just having a crisis of confidence around what kind of work should I actually do. Um, I had been in sales since I joined, you know, since I flew over from uh, from South Africa to, to stay in the UK in 2008. And that was the start of the GFC, the global financial crisis. Um, so I fell into a lead generation sales type role, very low paid, um, but just enough to kind of keep my head above water and stayed in sales for, the, you know, for the next five years and had a, had a really pragmatic and, and open conversation with the CEO of the last company I worked at in sales, um, who basically said to me, John, you're not a salesperson. You're a great guy. You're just not a salesperson, you know? And he's, he's, he's absolutely right. You know, I'm the kind of salesperson, if I do do sales, you know, if somebody doesn't want whatever we're offering, I kind of go, okay, you don't want it, then I'll move on, thanks. Um, whereas most salespeople would be a bit more kind of, sure, are you sure you don't want it? That type of thing. Um, so... I had a conversation with a friend of mine, Graham. He, he used to stay in the UK, now actually stays in Sydney uh, down the road. And he said to me, John, you've got to look for the golden thread. What is your golden thread? What is the essence that you can lift out of each kind of fundamental part of your life experience? And kind of group it together and say, okay, what does this make me? And... I realized, uh, and, and you know, if, if you want, if you want me to go into less detail, just shout. But I've I've been, I've had a career as varied as um, my first year out of school. Uh, I was a waiter for um, a variety of restaurants. I then 
came to London for a year and I studied a sound engineering diploma. I came back to South Africa. I worked in a sound studio as a post-production engineer um, for audio engineering for, I think it was eight months. Um, then was a DJ with a friend of mine. Um, he kind of he kind of started a, a, a music entertainment type company, which is basically both of us traveling all around Johannesburg um, and, uh, and and playing, you know, DJ gigs for friends and, and, and uh, you know, uh, 21sts and I think there was a wedding in there too. Um, and then decided to go to university about three years after, three years after that, did a business business degree, came out of that, worked as a tour manager for a band for three months, gained about 15 kilograms in those three months from eating all the pizza and drinking all the beers. Um, and after that, um, decided to kind of fix myself, if that makes sense. So I went on um, a course in neuro linguistic programming, which is, um, you know, uh, a, a, an approach to to excellence and uh, and kind of managing your mental state, you might say, in a, in a summary, and also hypnosis uh, and hypnotherapy. And I started my own company. I started my own company doing hypnotherapy and, and neurolinguistic programming um, <clears throat> interventions for people. And I kind of did a moonshot. I, I put a website up and said, oh, I do business consulting and I do personal consulting. And my dad kind of looked at me and he said, John, you know, you don't really have experience in any of these areas. Are you sure you want to be kind of leading with that? But I, I decided to boil the ocean and I put everything up there. And I, I wouldn't say I was hugely successful. I wasn't. But I had a few clients and I helped them solve a few problems. Um, and then decided to move to the UK on, on a little bit of a whim because I got a um, an inheritance from my, my grandparents passing. And I decided South Africa is not the place for me anymore. Moved over, over to the UK, bang, financial crisis and, and right into it. So the golden thread that you lift out of that is, you know, you start off in waitering, customer service, how to find out what people want really quickly and to give it to them without too much fuss or hassle. You look at um, the audio engineering side, how to troubleshoot, how to look at the signal flow between the microphone on, on the desk or in, in, on the stage and follow the train of ele electricity through the stage, underneath the stage, through to the, the, the kind of audio splitter box into the mixing desk, out into your speakers, which or your monitor speakers and out into the main speakers of the actual you know, venue or whatever, if you're doing kind of live music production. Um, and also process management. If you think about that as a process, um, uh, you know, my NLP and hypnosis work um, uh, <laughs> to, you know, how to, how to find out what not only the, the symptoms of a problem are, but also the causes and to dive into that and, and actually, you know, be outcomes focused and, and do that. So following that kind of golden thread all through that process, working in sales and lead generation sales, where you have to deal with a lot of tech customers. And so you have to learn surface level, a lot of what um, uh, each, each company has to do and then try and sell that over the phone to, to get a meeting for that particular company. Um, and then working in ethics and compliance, uh, sales, um, uh, culture building, uh, sustainability research, and then into Salesforce, finally, where um, uh, these two guys who started a company called Cloud Socius decided to give me a chance. And I was employee number 12. Um, and yeah, after a job, job hunt of about four months, um, managed to get my admin certification and, and, and start on the Salesforce kind of road. And that's me there right at the beginning of that journey. So. I'll give it. I'll give it a pause there. Just come up for air and <laughs> wonder that if is, you have any, any. That is a really, really interesting journey. To be honest, I like the fact that you've managed to pull out your golden thread, um, and it's. Can you tell me a bit more about um, how perhaps 
you've been able to translate? Is there any learnings from, say, the gigging that you've done as a, as a DJ? That, is there anything you bring with it in your current world in Salesforce? Um, yeah, I, th I think so, because um, as, as, a, as a kind of gigging DJ, you're, you're, you're self-sufficient. And, and when I say gigging DJ, I mean, it was just me and my mate and we had, <laughs> we had a couple of big speakers, um, a couple of, you know, CDJ decks and, and, and you know, they were his and then his, 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 um, his mixer. And then I think I bought the speakers and, and uh, he had the amp. And we used to just cart this around everywhere. So very self, being self-sufficient. Um, and also, you, you know, the, maybe the reading of a crowd reading of people in the room to say are they actually interested in what you're saying um and try and put something forward that they might be more interested in in the next statement or or, or um interaction i suppose um yeah that's off the top of my head i think yeah. fantastic that was that was the parallel i was trying to draw because if you're a solo consultant and i think when cloud social started it was quite small and therefore the consultant who goes on site has to do everything. You've got to be the project manager, you've got to be a BA, the person who does the build and the test and the training, and also mm -hmm. handle some of the scope management and expectation management that your sales team may or may not have promised and where your client may or may not have got the expectations right so you're juggling mm. so many balls so i was tr i don't know music very well and i don't know but i kind of imagine that that might be the same thing if you were going to do something for let's say a wedding and the bride tells you this is what we want um but things change during the day her mood changes the audience might change your kit might go wrong um, so it, from what I imagine, being able to do that, being able to troubleshoot on your feet while your customers in front of you, probably stood you in good stead. Is 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 my thinking. Being being adaptable, and and uh, I've got to say, at that age, um, pro probably the tequila <laughs> that helped also, right? <laughs> uh. Hopefully you weren't drinking on the job <laughs> when you started being a consultant. Oh, no, not, not, not as a consultant, but def definitely as a DJ. <laughs> I think you're 21, 22 years old, I think, yeah. So, um, um, so tell me. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Go on, go on. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted. No, 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 all, all, all good. You follow your thoughts through. Okay, so did you have to make a major switch in your mindset when you move from sales into consulting what was that you know change um is is very different working consulting but i wanted to get your take on it when you first started what was it about your first job cloud socials that made you think oh right that is such a different way of thinking mm. I'd like to hear some of the challenges that you had when you first came over. Several. Um, I think I was just so desperate to to do something of value and of meaning. Um, the sales life cycle is challenging for, and I've got a lot of respect for sales people because they they deal on a monthly reset or a quarterly reset. So a phenomenal amount of work, phenomenal amount of effort, sometimes get treated, you know, and, and sometimes justifiably so as, um, you know, uh, somebody not to be dealt with or spoken to or the, so the next thing, because if, if, if I get a phone call from a sales per person and they just want something from me, I'm also going to be quite distant from them. Um, <clears throat> you, you do develop a bit of a thick skin. I did struggle with it for a long time. Um, but essentially in my sales role, I started to find and do things that were more consultancy kind of focused anyway. So in my one sales role, for example, we were using Salesforce and I was 
spending a lot of time putting the reporting and the dashboards together. So I had a lot of kind of interactions with Salesforce and, and, and CRMs um, prior to that, you know, in the old classic uh, interface, putting the console view in place, for example, when doing high volume phone calls, at, say, I actually timed it. I remember timing it, you know, going through the regular route of going page to page to list view to page and so on and so forth. I, I shaved off, I think about 40% of time by bringing on the console view and being able to like phone, click the next one, phone, click the next one, phone and so on and so forth. So I was bringing a lot of that kind of in already, maybe naturally. Um, but the consulting thing really, I started off really well, I think. I had a really good trajectory over my first sort of six months and the company was growing really fast and we got to January of was it 2014 or 2015 you know anything past last week I sort of forget the <laughs> the proper dates but it was the January sort of shift um, the financial year end of Salesforce where they would often do a lot of deals and so we had a massive month at the same time as the person who was kind of looking after professional services decided to switch jobs to sales. And I thought, oh, I'll stick my hand up. This is this is pretty easy peasy. I'll do this. Uh, and I put myself into the professional services sort of, sort of manager role, completely unprepared for it. Um, uh, the organization as a whole, I think we were all quite naive to to the challenges around that, that level of growth. Um, and, you know, the sales thing is tell somebody you can do something even if you can't yet. You know, salesperson will go, oh, you know, we've got this platform, blah, blah, blah. And the client says, can it do, can it, you know, um, design a rocket for me? And we'll go, oh, no, yeah, 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 sure, we can design a rocket for you. No problem. Oh, no problem. Let's just, we'll get back to you on how long that'll take, you know. And then you kind of go home and scroll back to office and how do we do that? How do we figure out and, and all that type of stuff? And that is the worst, the worst thing that a consultant I think can do personally. I think the conversation to have is, I think we can po possibly do that. Let me go away and have a look and come back to you with a definitive answer. Because it's bitten us in the behind so many times. And by us, I mean me and my colleagues and you know, other people that I've seen had, had this happen. Um, where you get stuck in a situation where you just have no way out. You've promised some things, you can't deliver them. And, um, you know, I got, I got smacked down pretty quickly by, uh, and justifiably so, from, from uh, you know, what, what one of the particular clients I was working with where I'd kind of not understood the scope, I'd not understood requirements. Um, and, you know, at that stage, we were also put into those situations um, just blindly ignorant of the fact that there were these things called user stories. There were these things called functional and non-functional requirements. There were these things like, called solution design documents, for example. We were working on like something called proposal items and they were like high level epics of, I think it's kind of this stuff. And then you finger in the air, go, oh, I think that's 10 days or that's, you know, five days or, or whatever. Um, and so that, you know, that uh, combined with the pressures of, um, you know, too many projects in flight, um, I had 12 projects against my name and I was just saying yes to too much stuff. And, and I find out now that's actually a, a natural response to, um, not to trauma, but to, to anxiety and fear and, and you know, a threatening situation where you get your fight, flight, fear or fawn. And that fawn is that people pleasing side come out and i bet you've got some stories about that that kind of people pleasing let me just say yes to everything now because it de-escalates the situation and then we'll figure it out in two weeks time and maybe they've forgotten about it by then that type of thing um i don't know if that answered your question to to the degree that you were looking for but um it is all perfect because it goes into territory that interests me anyway Mm -hmm. um, what I found, you're absolutely right. I think for a lot of the smaller partners who, um, I think there's a book called E-Myth 
which is where everyone who does a business, who are in a business in, let's say, delivery or a hairdresser or cook, and they think, you know what? The owner of this restaurant or the owner of this hairdresser salon is making so much money off me. I think I can go away and I can run my own salon or run my own restaurant. But what happens then is they, they go ahead and do that and they aren't experienced or skilled in managing clients and the expectations and all the commercial bits around it. And so the smaller partners, what I have found is that, as you say, they say yes to everything because when you're running a business, you're in a um, situation where you not only have to pay your own bills, but if you have people on your payroll, you've got to pay them. And so you say yes to everything without perhaps the commercial training around how to structure a contract around a proposal, a statement of work, and how to manage all of that so that your people don't get overwhelmed. So it kind of trickle down from what I can see. And a lot of the partners are not, um, they are in these sort of situations, not, I would say, uh, I can't find the right words, but not maliciously or intentionally. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, um, not caring about their guys, but it's very much a mentality of feast or famine. If I don't say yes now, I'm not going to get the work later. And how am I going to pay my people? So it's a situation I think and feel that makes them feel like they're always on the back foot. They're always um, in a state of anxiety, as you say and always saying yes, and then let's figure it out later. Uh, and that's not kind of a place to be. And if you look at the COVID uh, time management quadrant, you've got your quadrant one, which is urgent and important. Quadrant two, which is important, but not urgent. And you've got quadrant three, which is urgent and not important. And quadrant four is the, you know, the dog stuff. And you spend all your life in quadrant one. And a lot of small mm -hmm. partners are in the same state, quadrant one, where we've got the current fire or crisis that we've got to deal with now. And let's hope that the stuff that the clients ask for that's stacking up in my to-do, they've kind of forgotten, or let's figure out how mm -hmm. to deal with it later. Um, not a great place to be. So it sounds like, you know, you had a, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, your transition from sales consulting was quite an eye-opening experience. Oh, baptism of fire, I think, is is maybe the, <laughs> the worst that you're looking for. And and yeah, to to, to ex expand on on you know exa exactly what you've articulated so well there is is um, I'm gonna, I'm going to go out and, and call a spade a spade. The the arrogance that I had to think that I could just walk in and be quite bullshy and, oh yeah, I can handle professional services management and I can handle this and handle that and so on and so forth. Yes, I can handle 12 customers against my name. And then, you know, I, I, I saw, you know, one of the guys who, who worked in my team was such a such a massive potential consultant. Um, yeah, he, 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 he was, he just wanted to take on work. He was like, oh, give me this, give me that. And then he got to seven projects against his name. And these are small projects. These are like two week engagements, one week engagements. This was really early classic days where there was this small little incre incremental pieces of work. And, and you know, one day he just came in and said, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm resigning. And I was like, why? And he said, oh, I've got too much work. And I said, but you were asking me for the work. And, and I just let him down. I, I let him down so badly because I was so arrogant and so... But without malice, and uh, I think the the founders of the of the organisation also had, you know, challenges with that, um, you know, that kind of behaviour and, and and mindset. I'll never forget the loneliest I've ever felt in a job was when stuff started to hit the fan, and we were supposed to have a group meeting every two weeks. You know, me, the the managed services manager. The, the two founders, the, the head of sales. 
and our CTO had left a couple of, you know, a month previously, or two, two, three weeks previously. And I came into the meeting and I was terrified and I was like, guys, we have a problem. I'm struggling here. And, and, and one of the founders just stopped me and he said, no, no, I don't want to hear that you are, I don't want to hear your problems. I want to hear solutions to your problems which is a very kind of bullshit way of also just going like, no, no, you need to solve it. And there's that, that kind of, that narrative and behavior in, 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 in some of the, um, you know, in, in, in some of the, the, the kinds of companies, you know, that, that you see in the marketplace. And that was a very lonely experience for me. And I could have chosen to leave, but I chose to kind of stick it out and try and learn from that situation. Um, I was demoted. I kind of worked through that process um, of, humbling myself in a way and I kind of you know lent perhaps towards a little bit of that false humility sometimes where it's like you know the um yeah let me not get too much into that but essentially those those choosing to to take the hits and stay at the company uh, and thankfully they kept me on and also to see the growth of that guy who said to me no no you know I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not interested in your problems. Come to me with solutions. Also to see the human growth of him where, you know, after a couple of months, he was put in a situation when one of the founders became a bit absent because he was looking at another business. And all of a sudden he was having to run the stuff himself and the growth of empathy in him, the growth of, um, you know, capability and, and, you know, eventually him, when um, the company was sold, coming on as CEO, and the the what I think is a, a fantastic working relationship I had with him um, up until when I left the UK, you know, in, in that company, and and he he had my back so many times after that, and I think it came down to the learnings that came out of that period, where you know we've got to have our colleagues' backs. We've got to provide enough structure and guidance and um, backing so we can set people up to be successful because it's a really, really lonely place to be when your company just goes, oh, we're not going to look after you. You know, you're on your own, son. Um, uh, and yet it's such a magic feeling when people go to bat for you and they're like, you know, we've got your back. Let's figure this out. Um, and yeah, so from one end of the spectrum to the other just uh you know just great to see just even to observe that kind of growth in, in that human you know thank you very much because that is such an interesting story from both perspective as well from your mm. perspective as the consultant at the firing end at the you know the pointy end of the whole engagement where you've got clients you know not not happy clients and you've got projects that might be having trouble and that you haven't got anyone backing you up from that point of view the fact that you chose to stay on when your other colleague didn't so i'm just going to just pause there for a moment and ask you a question what do you Mm -hmm. think what do you think was the difference between you and your colleague that made you stay and that made him leave I think, I think the difference, I think for him, it it was the right decision to leave because, um, you know, he was maybe 10 years younger than I was at that stage. Um, So he would have been about maybe 23, 24 years old. And for him to go into a company that had a bit more structure and a bit more backing um, and a bit more support for their consultants, perhaps, um, I think, you know, I, I, I look at him, I, I've, I've seen him on LinkedIn and he's doing fantastically well. He's doing fantastically well. And he's, you know, I think he, I, th- I don't know if he's left Make Positive now or he's still there, but I've, you know, I, ch- I check in every now and again and I see, oh, yeah, he's, he's doing fantastically well. And, that, and that's, that's a great thing to see because I think that's the right choice. I think the choice I made to, to stay um, is, is a double-edged choice because while I chose to um, to learn from the experience and you know 
there were definitely interactions and, and, and things that I could have handled differently, but it definitely helped me to, because so I, I, really, I really care about, um, I really care about doing the right thing for the customer. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's what the customer asks for, if that makes sense. Because some, sometimes the customer is like, I want this, I want that. And that's actually what, well, what you need is this. And fighting for what they need versus what perhaps sometimes they ask for. Um, I also, um, uh, I've become far more of an advocate for my colleagues and, and, and their growth and their support and so on and so forth. But and I, I don't think I would have done that as much if I had chosen to leave. Um, because you are, I think it's hard to develop empathy for somebody's situation if you haven't walked that, you know, walked that, that cold, dark valley yourself, you know. Um, and, and I had some really, really great experiences there and some really fantastic high. I left on a high when I, when I came across to Australia. Um, and they treated me really, really well, um, especially in the latter, the latter part of my time there. Um, but there was there was also a lot of cost. There was a lot of cost to me. There was a lot of um, situations where you know, you know, you, you find out that sometimes your work has been taken, um, and other people have taken what's the word uh, really? credit for it, and you know the, the the general kind of stuff that you get in in any kind of consultancy and work, and 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 the hard lesson of. You know, sometimes you're working and, and sitting in the office and working and other people go for beers and so on and so forth. And if you're not a big drinker, which I'm not, um, too much tequila when I was doing DJing, I think. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the socializing aspect of going out for drinks with colleagues and stuff and the impact that that has on career development is, is in my view, is, is a strong one. And I do advocate for people to obviously pre-COVID and, and hopefully post-COVID to, to, to make those social connections because you sometimes those conversations with with managers or leaders or founders or whatever can happen around a um, you know a pub table or something like that 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 potentially helps them move their career forward. It is unfortunate, but you know, you're you're the one invisible who's working back on stuff and like oh, I'm doing the right stuff for the customer, but actually you also got to think about your own career and some of that. I know I'm jumping from place to place. I think it's probably because it's late in the evening here and um, I'm, no, I'm you know what? A full, it's all, full, a full tummy. <laughs> it's all very interesting and it's all relates to the lifestyle that we're in, consulting lifestyle. And I, I, I don't mind because it's, it's stuff that, you know, allows me to talk about. So you're absolutely right. I think a long time ago when I was in consulting, there was this thing called Fagnet. Sorry, that's, you know, might have been taken in the wrong context for people in different continents. But in the UK, it's it's a smokers. Yeah. And the smokers who go outside to, get, to have a fag, to have a cigarette, um, they tend to get all the gossip, what's happening next, and then they would mm -hmm. bond. Um, and me not being a smoker was not part of that. And so I get that. I also don't drink. Also, you know, I don't go to the pubs when everyone goes to the pub. And then when I started a family, then there, were, there was literally no opportunities to do so. And I do. However, it's it's it, it's. I think it's quite different for different people. So for me, I think where I have got to in my career meant that I kind of didn't need to rely on that quite so much um, to progress in my career. For me, I feel I need to be a little bit more careful about what I say next because I think I'm quite charming and I've never felt that being excluded has stopped my career um, in, in, in a very significant way. And, and just let me share mm -hmm. with you why I think so. Number one, because I think... I play the foreigner card quite a bit. I play mm -hmm. the, um, you know, I don't talk to me about what's happening because I'm not, uh, I'm not shy about saying what I think and what I feel to get the attention that I feel I need. Mm -hmm. Hey boss, 
you're out there smoking and so and so said he heard x y and z i don't smoke give me the ghost please yeah. so i feel because i have this no shame thing um that i tend to get what i want quite quickly and easily um mm -hmm. so maybe this is one for those who you know any listener who who are early on in a career who may not drink may not smoke may not like the social pub culture or the mm. football culture in the UK and feel unable to be included to find a way to be more out there and to ask for what they'd like yeah yeah Yes. I, I've I've very much aligned to 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 what you're saying, and it just it just comes to mind that that um, one 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 of the you, I'm I'm a big advocate of self reflection um, because otherwise you know what's the point of going through something challenging if we don't learn from it? Um, in that, I suppose you could call it managing the chip on my shoulder because. Um, I could very easily create a narrative for myself, and I did create a narrative for myself of, oh, I'm being excluded from this, and and oh, I could see other people getting promoted into these roles, and and why aren't they taking me? Um, and then I I kind of did the um, the slightly passive aggressive approach of saying, okay, well, I'm not going to manage people then. I'll just I'll create a PMO and I'll do this, and and I'll manage the technology and the process and the practices rather than managing people um, because I was blocked from that because of this earlier situation with the, with the pro services manager uh, role that I, that I, uh, I was demoted from. And on one hand, it was fantastic. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, I can own this, this particular piece of work and you kind of do the best you can with what you know. Um, and hopefully I set enough of a foundation for people who are cleverer than me who came after me to take it forward and, and, and move it forward. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully left a bit of a good legacy there in, in terms of that piece. But that chip on my shoulder is, 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 is a, is a companion that I've had to manage and work with. Um, and, you know, you talk about being a foreigner, you know, um, I'm probably going to say something that, that might be a bit controversial, but there is, I'm South African. I'm, um, you know, born and bred in a, in a country that was in apartheid when, when I was born and grew up. We only went to school with, um, you know, black and Indian kids when I was standard two. So that was, I was maybe 12 years old, 10, 10, 10 11 years old. Um, and you get socialized into this superiority complex. And so the chip on the shoulder is is kind of you, you follow the train from there of no but i should be special i should be special i should be receiving the accolades i should be getting these things and it's a really subversive dangerous mindset to have and it pops up in all sorts of weird places um and i, I noticed that um and you could even generalize it to to the world as it is at the moment where there's this recognition that certain demographics in society have um, have derived benefit from the mere fact that they're in that demographic. And, you know, you call them privileged and, you know, call us privileged and so on and so forth. And so it's, 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 it's a millstone that's now, you know, I think, I think important for people of my demographic to look at and to understand and, to open our hearts and to, to, to try and understand other people's point of views, other people's journeys, other people's um, way of being in the world, their narratives and so on and so forth, so that we can, you know, I wouldn't say right, right the wrongs, but at least we can bring some balance to these things. Wow, that went, that went tangential. <laughs> Really quickly. But you know what? It's like I said, I, I, I'm loving the conversation because it is pertinent. And I'll tell you why. So I come from Malaysia. Mm. Malaysia mm. is an ex-British colony. And yeah. when you talk about status roles and you talk about superiority and inferiority complex, it is endemic in the culture. 
it, so if you're not white, you're not good enough. Full stop. Mm. Um, so things like for, uh, when we went to college and at work, if we had a somebody from the West as a lecturer in my college, he was paid miles more than a local. Uh, same with um, in the company as well. So in my company, we had we hired my CEO hired um, an Irish guy who just wasn't up to par with the my local colleagues. So it's 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 kind of endemic, and I can understand kind of where it comes from, the cultural and the historical context. And I come to the UK, um, and what I found because when um, starts working the offshoring bandwagon the outsourcing offshoring started early 2000 i did my mba thesis on that everyone was starting to get on a bpo you know business process outsourcing ship all the low value work over there keep all the high etc etc and so we you know so i started working with a lot of offshore consultants mainly from india basically um, and what I found is that a lot of people aren't aware of this historical and cultural context about how and why um, our offshore team isn't up to standards. And I've been in companies before where a project manager will say, don't work with so-and-so and so-and-so. They're just awful. I had them on my project. They, they just substandard mm. when i talk to them i realize that is not so when someone in the uk come across with an inferior superior tone suddenly yeah. all the cultural nuances will put them down and it's very much a yes sir no sir i'm not going to tell you any bad news sir that situation and that is a very non-productive tone to have in a project when mm. fires happening all the time and you need your team to be totally open and candid about the challenges that they've had so that you can help them get it across to the finish line and so even though it feels very meandering our topic i think it is very very relevant because now in the world of zoom it's opened up projects are becoming more global now you can have your data migration consultant sitting in Poland and you can have somebody doing your um, coding in, you know, in Romania or something like that. And understanding how they work and why they behave a certain way would go a long way towards, you know, bringing project home. So you've shared your experience about this chip on your shoulder. Tell me about that chip is it smaller now how are you managing it now how are you are you more conscious are you more aware what how are you helping yourself manage this chip that's a great question um i think a a multi-dimensional approach you might say um i just wanted to say one one small thing about what you just mentioned i think i think it's such an important point of view that you bring forward um, and it struck me that that there's this stereotype of um, dealing with offshore teams sometimes where they, 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 you know you, you get some somebody of my demographic who's, who's maybe done a study of the cultural differences between you know organizations and authority and people and stuff like that and then they say in, in in more sort of Eurasian cultures, it's it's the um, the saving of face that's more important. But I wonder, what is the communication and how is the communication delivered before that saving of face? Is it aggressive communication that's led by the Westernized approach of quite direct and quite, you know, tell me what's happening. Have you do you understand what's happening? You know. What have you done here? What have you done in this project? And the person's going, I don't want to look like an idiot here, and therefore shuts down and goes, goes that. Versus the softly, softly approach of, hey, we're all safe, we're all good. Let's discuss some things. Let's talk about how this works and how that work works. And and this 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 westernized kind of ultra focus on on um, 
being being you know only perfection is 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 the best thing to go for and and you see that people go people you know they they glorify this oh yeah if you if you if you if you aim for the moon then you might hit the sky you know and and the, the unconscious stuff that happens of never good enough have you, I'm sure you've had those sprints where you start off the sprint, and I did, I did this to my team in, in one of the last projects um, I worked in, and I, I recognized it afterwards. I was like, oh, you idiot. And you start off the sprint, and you say, we're going to go do a stretch goal, guys. We're going to do a stretch goal. No problem. We've got 20 points of capacity here, but I think we're going to, I think we can hit 25. And this is the first sprint. This is before we've even normalized as a team. Um, I was playing, you know, we had a project manager, but she was quite green, so I was kind of playing the, you know, playing the, the, the scrum master as, as such. And after the first sprint, we delivered maybe 17 points, which is actually quite good for a first sprint. And yet we've we've got seven points that we haven't hit. And so already in the client's mind, we, we stretched for this and we underperformed. And I remember thinking afterwards going like, why the hell didn't we just go, um, you know, let's aim for 15 points. And that's good enough. And if we get more, that's great. But let's kick the goal first. Let's, you know, get the ball between the posts uh, first and then, you know, build on that that, that positive. Sorry, I just kind of went on a tangent there. And you'd asked me a question about my chip on my shoulder um, and how I I managed it. I I talked about multidimensional approach. Um, I think... The core approach that I've used is to recognize that it's not all about me. And that's made my life, my enjoyment of work, far more profound. Because when it's all about me, it's all about my chip on the shoulder and am I getting enough? Am I doing enough? And, you know, the external, almost that seeking of external validation of like, did I kick that goal? Am I good enough here? Like, you know. And that focus on me myself takes me away from it, from the experience of helping others, you know, um, and enabling others to do well and supporting others and being that, you know, having somebody else's back where, you know, people like my, my old CEO, Gareth, has had my back on so many occasions. Um, finding those special people who are really, really talented and actually really good at what they do. And they just put in situations where they can't succeed and providing them with enough of a support structure around them so they can like build confidence and succeed and so on and so forth. You know, I had a manager at a previous role um, who, who who taught me how to do that um, or gave you opened the door to me learning how to do that. And I still think I have more to learn. Um, yeah, by shifting the focus to other people, how can I enable them? How can I do better? And and you learn better by teaching. I've got a question for you. How much more have you learned and how much more, more rounded has your knowledge and, and understanding become and wisdom become since you've started teaching consultants, articulating it and teaching them? I, <clears throat> I would say that... Um, the candid answer is not that much. Okay. Because when, so what I've learned is how people absorb and how to pitch things so that they are able to embed the skills that I'm training. So th- that's where I learn. My learning at the moment comes from that, comes from mm-hmm. all the other things or the other aspects that has to do with entrepreneurship. So the marketing, the social, and you know, all, all, all these other things, video editing and podcasting new stuff Mm. with regards to consulting because i've done it for so long 20 25 years in microsoft in salesforce in different size companies uh, i tend to see a lot of patterns emerge and because like you i'm also a fan of self uh, development and self growth and i also went through the nlp course for example and i read quite a lot around psychology of behavior and things like that so um, what I'm seeing now is the consolidation of all the stuff that I've read so the things that I hear is just solidifying the things that I've learned in in terms of the learning so 
I haven't found anything that surprised me yet. I am waiting. So the, the, the big thing that I'm you know holding quite close is that I believe that in consulting, you can't have a pure agile methodology. I keep going on about this. You can't have a pure agile. You can have pure agile if you're a software house, <clears throat> for example, or you're an end user and you're in a business as usual mode and you're delivering mm-hmm. sprint after sprint of just a list of features. But when you're in a project, where a transformation project where going from A to B is a huge distance, huge cultural change in terms of people, process and technology. You can't sprintify, you can't agile pro- properly. This is my personal opinion, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I've had people disagree. Uh, and when I kind of dig down into it, it's found that no, it's, it's, it's not pure agile. It is basically a hybrid because at the mm-hmm. end, you still need a big ass testing phase for all the integration and the migration and stuff. You can't. <clears throat> so that's the one thing I'm, I'm waiting for someone to prove me wrong um, on, on, on this end. I would love it. I'd love to have a good conversation with someone who said, I've done it this way, all agile, and we've done a magnificent um, piece of work. So my podcasting, my interviewing people, I haven't yet got to that point. I would love to learn that bit but um, not so far. Don't know if I answered that question for you. Yeah, yeah. That's very but, interesting. Uh, fascinating. But there's a few things in what you said earlier that I'd like to kind of touch on when I asked you sure. about your chip. So you were asking about the communication style, whether you start with aggressive or whether you start with softly, softly when we're approaching offshore teams or teams of people that you don't, you haven't worked with before so you don't know their style Mm. for me um because i think you consume my content you know i talk a lot about active listening Mm. Uh, and that's the approach that i always start with my team whoever they might be wherever they might come from i started that way so i'm of the opinion that you need to lay the foundations first and not try and provide a safe environment when the house is on fire and that is kind of too late already so mm. i started right at the beginning when i get my team um, my internal kickoff is i share my style and my style is we're all in this together everyone will have an equal voice and i do not punish mistakes if you tell me early enough And I will set expectations really, really early. And you have to manage my expectations so that if you're having trouble halfway through, if let's say you've got to do four points in four days, let's say. Mm -hmm. And in day two, you're stuck in the first bit. You have to already tell me. You can't wait till you're 75% through and Mm -hmm. tell me you're still stuck on the first bit. That way I can't help you. I will get a bit cross if you get to that point. But I urge you to tell me when you're right in the beginning, keep me up to date so I can keep my eye on you and I can find a way to help you. That way I'm creating a really, really safe space and I will have one-to-one with all my team, especially those in India. A lot of them are in a, an environment internally where hierarchy is really strict. Mm -hmm. They call their bosses, sir. We don't do that in the UK. And they're deathly afraid of their manager. So I provide a safe space for them and I protect them. And I will tell them, if you're having trouble, you tell me. Don't go to your line manager and I will back you up. And that's helped me in all my projects because... Let me tell you a small story. When I didn't do this this one time, a lot of my Team India thought that I was like the other project managers in the UK in the same company. And there's this one lady who was my developer and, and um, she had a miscarriage. She chose not to tell anyone, but she was falling behind. And so the people around her was helping her with her work, but they didn't know as much as she did and the whole project stole. <clears throat> and it wasn't until much later that it all came to light 
And so um, from then on, I made sure that I have this little one-to-one -one with everyone and I get them to turn on their um, video as well. That's the other thing. Okay, touch on video very quickly. A lot of people in India that I know in some of my team, they're very shy to turn on the video because their house isn't as beautiful at the time. You know, there was no backgrounds and stuff as, you know, as, as the people in the West. And um, I had this one, so my <clears throat> colleagues in the UK was giving them everybody a tour of his new house. And I could tell without them speaking, a lot of our Indian counterparts were just, oh my God, that's amazing. And, you know, I live in this place. And so that reinforces a lot of the hierarchy. I'm not as good as you, I'm inferior, I'm low. You know, so as a project manager, I'm very, very conscious of things like that. And I don't encourage the share me your house kind of thing. If I know that some of our Indian counterparts are on the call because they might not say it. Um, so just being very aware that they are aware of a distance and 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 just minimizing that uh, as much as possible um very quickly on you were talking about your sprint and your stretch goals and things like that and that goes to managing expectations right and i know you might be ambitious but maybe it's a way that you frame the language mm -hmm. in the future because everybody wants to get that 25 points right um but, you know, just telling the customers, I think 17 is great, but we really want to push for 25. So in the customer's mind, you know, like watermark, I see my expectations as watermark where you are creating that watermark first. So if you can hit that, they're happy. So it's it's just the being mindful of the language. I, I use that all the time as well, you know, making sure that whatever, everybody, my team, my peers, my managers, everybody's got this expectation watermark around whatever it is the topic of conversation and I want to make sure that I can hit that watermark and I manage or reset the expectations accordingly oh yeah I, I, I love that I love that um uh by the way time wise I'm fine to continue uh, just respectful of your time also you, you happy to chat longer or uh we, we can also have a part two and I've had that with a few of my colleagues, you know, sometimes the conversation is so intense and there's so many topics that we want to talk about. I'm very happy to have a part two with you because I think we went off on really fascinating tangents. And okay. even though they feel like, you know, it's gone everywhere, but it's really important as well um, mm. to a lot. I think a lot of the audience that I've got are in the consulting field and it's important from, um, you know, you're talking about exclusion, about uh, the smoking, the drinking and not being part of that network, how that mm -hmm. impacts um, and the cultural differences and the awareness of that chip and the where you've come from and how that's impacted how you see things and how you work and how you interact with people. They're all really important things. So... Mm -hmm. I wouldn't in any way, shape or form want to snip out any part of our conversations because it's relevant mm. to you, me and everyone in the Salesforce ecosystem, especially in the consulting world. So mm. I tell you what, why don't we call it a close now? And if you're happy to arrange a part two, I would be happy to record a, a second one with you. How about that? Oh, I'd, I'd love that. I'd love that. Um, and and just to express my appreciation to you and and, and to what you're doing, because I think it's, it's really fantastic. Um, I, I did want to, like, uh, you know, you know, when you're having a conversation, like you kind of get the cue going, oh, I want to talk about this. I want to, like, I've, I've got a cue that's <laughs> stretching. Um, yeah, uh, expectation, accountability, accountability follows expectation. Um, and I'd, I'd really love in, in our second session to drill into the nuances of communication that, that you've started to, 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 to track, um, you know, 
people observe and they say, oh, this person looks like they have it all together. How do they keep calm and, you know, manage really, really tough clients and really tough situations um, where inside the person's actually like just, just holding on, you know, or managing their emotions in a particular way or, or that. And I'd love to kind of unpack some of that stuff with you also, because I think, I think you, you've, you've probably been in some gnarly situations also. <laughs> and um, yeah. I have. But let me just leave you with a little tip here because um, I've I've got a friend, Ryan, mm-hmm. and he was uh, 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 an ex-Marine and he's done, he was a Marine for about 12 years. So I think he's seen some really crazy stuff. And we had this conversation uh, some time ago. He was in, uh, it was one of project ma- managers in my team at Make Positive. And we talked about this and he said, once you've gone through all of that, nothing is serious anymore. You got customers yelling at you. You just think, compare it to what you've been through. And so yeah. I borrow from that. And when I get into a crazy situation, I go like, what would Ryan think about this? And that just kind of sails me through because- no, um, Nobody's shooting at me. Uh, I'll think I'm all right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think it's perspective in the end. Mm. It's perspective and you know, ability to master your emotions so that, you know, you've got somebody who's yelling at you in your face, you're just dealing with that. So, but let yeah. we can go into that a lot more next time. Um, sure. Just very quickly. So when you're talking, I'm actually writing notes and I'm actually writing my cues down, uh, okay. which, is, which is how I can pick it up and say, let's drill into this. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much for your time today. And I appreciate all the things that you've shared, all the colorful flavors of topics we've <laughs> talked about. Oh, no, awesome. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me on and um, looking forward to, to, to our next session. And it's great to meet you. It's great to, to, to have the opportunity to, to connect. And um, yeah, uh, really appreciate it.